Hi, everybody. This is Bill Noble from Token Metrics, and welcome to our crypto deep dive series. Today, I'm joined by Seth from Mind Your Biz. Seth, welcome. Hey, Bill. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure spending time with the Token Metrics team. Yes, it's great to have you. Not only do we like you, but you have a unique perspective on the market that everybody, your viewers, and our viewers are going to enjoy. So, if you're interested in the state of Bitcoin mining, the state of proof of work mining, the ETH merge, and the Solana hack, well, don't go anywhere. And don't forget to like and subscribe to whatever channel you're watching this on. And definitely smash the like button for Seth. All right, Seth, let's start with, you know, who you are and what's your unique angle in crypto. I understand you come from like a, a tech background. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So here's Seth Estrada in 30 seconds and what led into Mind Your Biz. I was a former senior national trainer for several Fortune 50 tech companies. Top of that list would be, and most recent, Microsoft, prior to that Google, prior to that Samsung Telecom USA, as well as Dell, AT&T, and a couple of contactless payment companies that launched at about the same time that Bitcoin became popular. After my t uh, tenure there, I looked for something that I found more meaningful and that I could be a little more passionate about. The open source community, Linux, and then cryptocurrency and Bitcoin really fit the bill for me. So I jumped in with both feet and I really, I just haven't looked back. All right. So let's jump into Bitcoin mining. I had the smartest hedge fund guy I know come in and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it. The ticker symbol is HUT, H-U-T, HUT 8, right? What is the state of Bitcoin miners? Like, I know a lot of these guys sold into weakness. You know, tell us what's the latest thing in proof of work. And if you know anything about these miner stocks or miners in general, like give us an update on that if you can. Sure. So first off, uh, there's been quite a bit of carnage in both the, the retail side of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining, as well as the institutional side of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining. I think you mentioned one, HUT8, that has been mercifully spared by the markets bill. But there's a lot of casualties that we've seen along the way now. And a lot of these companies ha having to sell into weakness because they just don't have any other options to cover their OPEX. It's just that simple. If you stop paying your bills... The power gets shut off and you're no longer in business as a miner. So it's been a very tricky time. And, uh, you know, there's some people who I know who work in that space who've been affected by it. So first off, my heart goes out to the, the victims of the market carnage. Uh, it always claims somebody, you know, right? So, uh, so that's kind of a bummer to see. But to answer your questions about sort of that whole institutional mining stock and institutional large scale mining operation that people might be interested in, there are several competitors who compare very favorably to HUD-8. I'm not going to mention them right now. I don't want it to come across as a shill fest or me picking favorites at all. Um, but there are several companies like HUD-8 that are uh, located throughout the world, have mining operations set up all around the world, so they mitigate the risks of having the cost basis for their power or their OPEX kind of spike out of control or out of their projections. And some of them are formed in various territories throughout the world. So it may be something that's accessible to North American investors, but some of them might not be. So need to kind of say that up front. There may be some of these competitors in the institutional mining space to HUD-8 that maybe are not an option for your audience, depending on where you live as an investor. You might not be able to uh, invest in these groups, but they are, uh, they're a great way to go when the market starts to turn. We're going to begin to see who from this downturn is strong enough to weather the storm. And we're going to see who has the infrastructure, who has the reserves, um, and who is prepared to begin to buy up that blood. When you have the other miners that are selling into weakness, you got to have a, you know, you got to, or the other the miners that are selling weakness, you got to have a buyer for every one of those sales, right? Um, ideally, right? You have to have the buy and sell orders matched. Well, I think in a perfect world, from a miner's perspective, all of those sales into weakness in the mining sector will be bought up by other miners uh, to help build up their operations. So we'll see a lot of consolidation, I think, in that space. And we'll, we'll see a very clear winner emerging in the next several months, for sure. So any idea what the industry's cost of production is i know that's like a kind of a yes or no answer but i mean i on twitter it was 14k and that became everybody's price target i mean you know does it does it vary cost of production and if so do you have do you know how much 
It absolutely does. And I'm glad you asked, because that is the bottom line question for Bitcoin mining and any Bitcoin mining operation. What's difficult is the uh, this concept of the the uh, cost for power versus the all in delivered rate and then the on shelf delivered rate. So imagine, if you will, you get a mining rig as a retail participant. You plug it in in the basement or out in the garage, someplace that isn't bothering you by way of noise. But you then get to put a voltmeter on the end and see exactly how much power it's consuming. Well, you can see that as a line item on your power bill at the end of the month and get a pretty solid sense for how much each kilowatt hour of your electricity is costing you and how much is being consumed by that machine. Well, when you scale that up into a giant airplane hangar full of them, well, you've set up racks, you've set up conduit, and you've set up various different sub panels to run that electricity out to all of those machines. You very likely needed to work with the utility to stage maybe an entire uh, series of transformers outside of the building because they don't have enough power run to that warehouse. So there are a lot of hidden costs when mining scales up, but the most recent, uh, the, the most common cost to run a miner is somewhere between three to seven cents per kilowatt hour. And that winds up providing one full Bitcoin produced at anywhere between 10 to $14,000, sometimes as low as eight or nine, but that's very rare to, uh, to see a mining operation that can do that at scale. All right. Interesting numbers. We appreciate that. So let's go to proof of work. Let's go to the ETH merge. I'll tell you what I know, and then I'm dying to hear what you know. So obviously when ETH goes, when 2.0, when ETH goes to proof of stake, conceivably there could be a fork I've heard with ETH1 and ETH2. You know, ETH1 is said to go down, but a lot of people want to buy that. Is there going to be a day where we have like a proof of work ETH that's used as money and a proof of stake ETH that's like a highway for dApps? I mean, can you, can you unpack the proof of work aspect of the ETH merge for us at all? Just a little bit, yeah. But uh, that proposal to have some kind of a proof of work fork of the current chain state of ETH, it's, uh, well, I don't have a very bright outlook uh, on its future. I think that that's probably doomed to fail. And here's why. Bill, as you know, something that the entire industry relies on for all of trading and investing, generally speaking, especially those who are decentralization maximalists, we need stable coins. And if Circle decides that it's going to pull its support from any fork of Ethereum for the USDC coin, which would then trickle down to affect the DAI stable coin. And then, of course, if Tether decides that it's going to pull its support from any proposed fork, well, it's dead in the water, right? It's it doesn't go any farther than that because we no longer have liquidity to match against our favorite trading pairs denominated in U.S. dollars at least. So that causes a serious problem. And sooner or later, that the, because of that loss of value that would have been locked on those chains, the rest of the value bleeds out and this new, this new chain dies, unfortunately. That's my take on it. Could play out very differently. Blockchain has definitely taught us to be nimble and you know, not be too certain about some of these things. It can, we can be surprised for sure. But I think that's what I see coming up if if there is a pro proposed proof of work fork of Ethereum is that the uh, the sort of taste makers and the uh, the ones that are really going to decide the fate of that chain will be the stablecoin issuers. And then to a lesser extent, some of the tentpole ERC-20 tokens like Chainlink, like your, now your Shiba Inus and others uh, that, that just have so much value locked that uh, any fork that doesn't have those captive not going to make it. So that's my first part. Second part is, as far as there being any kind of a, a ETH1 or an ETH2 approach, this is something that we commonly refer to as second layer scaling solutions. And this is something that Optimism, Arbitrum, and maybe to a lesser extent, uh, chain, side chains like Polygon provide in a dedicated way to Ethereum right now. So even if this new beacon chain merge fails to provide all the speed that Ethereum maximis, maximalists hope it will, we already have these three custom solutions that were designed directly to scale Ethereum already. They're already in production. They already scale pretty well. They're not perfect, but they are faster than Ethereum. They carry more capacity than Ethereum. And they already have a pretty significant amount of TVL. I think last estimates were somewhere between four and $5 billion value locked across those three chains. So I think they're already kind of 
helping to carry a little bit of that capacity, and they could scale up to carry the full 200 billion plus of a TVL that Ethereum currently holds itself right now and share that load across those four chains combined. So there is a way for us to move forward with that already. But uh, some of the proposals of a fork of Ethereum, some of the proposals of, you know, proof of work for the money and proof of stake for, you know, for the for the rails and for the smart contracts. Uh, I think that the Solidity developers, people who write the code, I don't think that they're looking forward to having that kind of a, you know, a, a, a bifurcated or a split system. I think they want to deploy their code on one chain and continue to have bridges to other places that maybe move fast. But again, that's my take on it. All right, that makes sense. Now, drum roll, the Solana hack, right? How did it happen? And, and what do you think, you know, this is going to say about Solana? Like, for example, did it, was this failure so big that they've got to suddenly make big improvements to their network? So is the bad news good news? You know, what, what do you know about the Solana hack? Well, uh, first thing, again, expressing my condolences to those who've been damaged by the hack, because they're just as we saw with Luna and UST, Bill, th this affects some people in a very personal and very real way. So we again, if we don't know somebody directly, it's guaranteed that two degrees of separation from our circle, we know somebody somewhere who has lost a significant chunk of their livelihood. So uh, so truly apologies to anybody who's been affected that directly by this. Um, what do we say in crypto? You might be able to make it all back in one trade. So don't lose hope. Um, but right now, sorry that uh, sorry for the loss. As far as this being a hack that was executed on Solana, what I think we has been uncovered at this point is that the main culprit was a kind of lesser known wallet that goes by the name Slope. So the Slope wallet on Solana failed to have the best security practices and they managed to store all of the seed phrases those of us who are in blockchain know this is this is everything this is the holy grail of security this is the one thing you can't share with anyone or ever store in plain text they stored it in plain text it was a plain unencrypted text file that held everybody's seed phrase who had ever used that wallet as of the last time the oh, google wow. chrome store showed 80,000 downloads of this wallet. So if you'd ever touched it, if you'd ever imported your seed phrase from your ledger, no less, or any other device or any other wallet you might want to use, you were compromised. So it, it wasn't really a Solana hack per se. It was a wallet hack. And uh, it still shows that this is a permissionless system. These are all permissionless networks. And when somebody says, hey, we made a wallet, uh, it bears a lot more scrutiny before we decide to use just any old wallet that comes along. So... Yeah, it's unfortunate, but I think in a way, it is good for the industry to mature a little bit. That said, a lot of people who got into Solana, Bill, they're not like you or me. They don't have the years of experience prior to Solana existing. Many of them were brought into blockchain with their first experience and That's their right. first blockchain being Solana. So they were blindsided because there was no renewed push by this project to emphasize security. Before Slope Wallet, there was Phantom Wallet, Soul Flare, and a couple other competitors in that space. Only a handful of them actually supported hardware wallet backup. And then Ledger and Trezor, the two main incumbents in the hardware wallet scene, didn't have Solana support from day one, which, I mean, I don't think there's a really good excuse for that. I think a VC-backed group like FTX and Solana, they have every reason to go in advance to some of these hardware wallet manufacturers and get that support from day one. I think that's the key takeaway from me, Bill, is that when wow. we see VC backing for a project, there is fiduciary responsibility to protect users. Full stop. All right, well, that's actually an angle I have not heard on Solana. There was a rumor that hardware wallets weren't, you know, were affected by the hack, but it's interesting to hear from you that you know, there weren't that many hardware options, which again, you know, our heart goes out to anybody impacted by, you know, the Solana situation. So in the layer one world, I mean, do you, do you happen to have your eye on, you know, any play, like whether it's optimism or any of these other layer ones that either may benefit from the Solana hack or may do well in any next rally, right? Like, Personally, I, I look at the layer one rally from last year and I go, God, are, are all these layer ones going to make it? 
you know, do, do you have any thoughts on, on that component? Like what's going to carry forward into the next cycle, whether it's a layer one or otherwise? Wow. It's so difficult to say. Again, we saw that the last rally or the last bull run, there were some competitors that sort of filled the role in the smart contract layer one uh, playing field then, such as EOS, right? EOS. We all forgot about EOS. And I came to, I mean, I thought about it recently and I'm not an EOS fan by any means. I, I hold zero EOS. This is not an endorsement. It's not my favorite project, but it dawned on me They've never had a hack or a slowdown the way that Solana has, and they've been in operation for years already. No hacks, no slowdowns. They've had all the throughput. So it's just to say sometimes what's old is new again. Uh, at, at EOS was accused of being too centralized, which in my opinion, it probably is. But Solana is as well, right? Very similar fundamentals there. But it's like we all forgot, and we went for the shiny object yet again. So I don't know. I think it's too early to say. I think we may find that in the next bull run, we have the next EOS slash Solana, and we forget about both. Just really difficult to say at this point. All right. Well, forgive the cringe factor, but that's why we're always looking for the dark horse here on the Token Metrics Deep Dive. All right, Seth, mind your biz. Tell everybody where they can find you. I know you've got a second YouTube channel, Twitter. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. On Twitter, it's mine, your underscore biz. And on YouTube, the fastest way to subscribe to whatever my current primary channel is, is just to go to in your browser, sub, that's S-U-B, dot M-Y-B, like mine, your biz, dot L-O-L. Because, you know, when I do the long form content, we do try to keep it lighthearted. All right. Seth, mine, your biz. We appreciate you coming on our show and sharing you, uh, your unique expertise. We definitely want to have you back. All right, this is Bill Noble from Token Metrics. We will see you next time.